So my next guest is an Irish man who's mocked the week and toured the world as one of our most successful stand-ups since opening the, at the Edinburgh Festival uh, last August. His latest tour has been bagging rave reviews everywhere from Newcastle to New York City and he's also coming to a stage near you later this year. We are delighted he swapped standing up for sitting down with us tonight. Give it up for the brilliant Ed Byrne! <laughs> They know I'm a Prince fan. They that's know you're nice a Prince of, fan. That's a nice bit of research, that. This is how we do it. This is how... Welcome, dear boy. Thank you very much. Uh, congrats on the new show. Thank you. Uh, which means the return of the pre-show pint. The pre-show pint, which yes. Is the, which is the pre-work ritual we all want, Ed, yeah, to be yeah. fair. Yeah, I just... I, I take a photograph of myself uh, wherever, I, wherever I am, whatever town I'm in, I try and find a decent pub with a decent pint and I, and I, I, I tag the, the, the brewery, preferably, and I just let... Yeah. It's mo most of my Instagram is just a it's just a, a, a collage of drunkenness. Um, there we go. It's just yeah, just me posting Sydney, wherever I happen to be. Uh, not sure where that is. I have uh, no idea. That one looks like dishwater, but I think it was pretty tasty. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, how, have I, how am I not viral? That was New York. That, that was, was, that was, was New definitely York. New York, that one, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I believe there was one with, uh, with bras on the ceiling as well. That was New York <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, um, So, yeah, basically what it is, it's, um, it means that uh, by, by, it take, by turning it into a marketing technique, it makes the, all the beer I drink on tour tax deductible. <laughs> which is, um, yeah. Genius bit of work. <laughs> and that's a, that's a major cost. And the, what Bill Werber knew was to snooker, I am to comedy, but just, that's a deep cut. That, 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 that's a reference for the young people there, Bill Werber <laughs> Mm. <laughs> the kids mm. are, uh, they're, they're keeping tabs on you. Yeah, uh, they this, follow me. They follow you. Now, they, well, they follow you online, but they also follow you. They have a, a, an old-fashioned map, Yeah. a proper map in the house. This is what uh, Ed's kids have here. Have Where is dad, is dad? Yeah. And Which... Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of sad that Where Is Dad is actually written, somebody has pointed out it's written deep in the sea, which doesn't make yeah. it seem a little bit more. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's how, they, how, they know, how they know where I am, yeah. So this is because... Cosmo and Magnus. Yes, that's right. I named my eldest son Cosmo. No, you're a showbiz wanker. Awesome name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, Cosmo and Magnus, they're, they're, they're 17 months in the age difference. Uh, my okay. wife didn't want there to be too big a gap, so she had them both by caesarean. That's a good joke, <laughs> if not a very nice one. <laughs> it takes a little bit of a moment to get it. Well, after a while, you go, oh, oh yeah, you're right, that oh, is a good joke. Yeah, oh, yeah, people yeah. maybe may have got that straight away, Ed. <laughs> uh, I have to say, uh, mm. the, between the two of these guys, yeah. Uh, they're still providing you with material. Yeah. I know you have to be very careful what you say in well, front totally, of them. Totally, totally. I mean, you know, you've got kids, right? You, yeah, you, you, I, my, mine are, you know, five and eight. Which... Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, when I, when I were younger, that was it, because it's around that age that they, that they, where you really start to see yourself in them. And the first time you hear your own exact words come out of your child's mouth, that's always frightening. Because I'll, right, I'll give you an example. I remember when, when they were younger. So like young kids, like yours, like five, six, seven, that kind of age, a lot of time a, a child will ask a question. And before they've even finished asking the question, they've already decided they don't give a shit what the answer is, right? So they'll, <laughs> they'll ask you a question, you'll answer it. And they're almost looking at you like, what are you talking about? I'm sorry, I've moved on since I asked that question. My, my, life, my life moves fast. And then they'll go, oh, maybe I still want to know the answers. They'll ask it again. And like a mug, you'll answer it again. <laughs> but the third or fourth time our kids ask the same question, me and my wife now, we have a sort of stock answer where we just go, do you know what? I've answered that question already. I'm not going to answer it again. It's a bit arsey. It's hardly child abuse. Harsh, they have good lives. Harsh, right, harsh but you know. fair. <laughs> so then, it, but the problem, what it led to was we're, we were at home. My elder son, Cosmo, was eight at the time. He's got another kid in the house who's also eight on a play date. My kid is showing this kid the game of Minecraft on an iPad because this kid's never seen Minecraft because his parents live under a rock. <laughs> and, oh, have you brought a little Amish boy home to play? That's nice. Anyway, <laughs> he's showing him how to play Minecraft. And the kid asks the question about how something happens in the game, how something gets made or whatever. Cosmo answers it in a way I didn't even understand and I play the game. So the poor kid asks the question again and I hear my eight-year-old son say to his eight-year-old mate, 
you know what? I've answered that question already. I'm not going to answer it again. <laughs> and I go, oh, no. What have I done? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, so, but, but, but come cut on. To, you... Cut to bedtime. I'm putting him in bed. I have to explain to an eight-year-old boy how if he talks to other people the way I talk to him, <laughs> other people will think he's a dickhead. <laughs> now, that's true. That, that's true, because he's like, but I was, I was honestly, the way you spoke to him, you really sounded like a dickhead. But I was just talking to him the way you talk to me. Yeah, life's not fair. Life's, life's, not, life's not fair. Does that mean you and Mummy are dickheads? No! When I tell this story, possibly on the Late Late Show, I will very much make you out to be the dickhead in the story. So you, you and Mummy are dickheads. I've answered that question already. I'm not going to answer it again. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to be relieved, though. Yeah. That, that there's a relief when they're when they're funny. When they're funny, yeah. When they're funny. It is nice to, to feel that you're at least passing that on. That you can, you know, that the, that the, the ability to tell a story. I saw that. I saw that particularly in in Magnus when we were. We're actually we were here. We were driving around. I was showing them the land of my birth. We were driving to to Glendalough, and the kids were in the car, and they were just they were just doing a back and forth thing. They were just making up a story. Like a, like a little kids' improv game. They were just making up stories about As they do. As they do. It was about, about a really unfortunate man. It was just, just, they were just torturing a fictitious character for their own amusement. It was all like, yeah, and then he fell down a hole, and then a snake bit him. Yeah, and then he pooed in his pants. You know, just, <laughs> just, just kids being kids, right? And then, oh, Magnus just came out with a line. Because Cosmo said something like, yeah, and then he gets hit by a car. And then Magnus just went, yeah. And then he died and went to heaven, and God punched him. <laughs> I, he was six. He was six. Then he died and went to heaven, and God punched him. Like that's, he was six. He's coming out with death metal lyrics. Like, that's, like, can you think of a story that wouldn't be improved by having that line tacked onto the end of it? Like, that's just the, I had to pull over. I was laughing so much. Uh, and, and I'm assuming then that, that they are now charging for this material. I, I, that, I, I swear is to there, God, is there, there, a, is there a I told that story on stage, and I, I, that, that story about Magnus went in, and, and now... And, and I, and I, 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 do you know what? I put 50 quid in his bank account. I said, thanks for that. That's a funny joke. And I put 50 quid in his bank account. And then his mother stepped in as his agent <laughs> and negotiated an unheard of pound a show fee. I have to pay him a pound a show for that line. Wow. And now Cosmo wants in on the action. I have to pay him a pound a show for. Yeah. I've answered that question already. I'm not going to answer it again, <laughs> which is my line. <laughs> I'm buying my own words back off my children. It's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I've missed you, Ed. <laughs> I've missed you. <laughs> the ability to get worked up over nothing. It's good. Still managing. It's good. Mm. Uh, I've got to talk about this uh, new show, which show. has been getting rave reviews. Right. Uh, Tragedy Plus Time, it is about your brother, Paul. Yes. Uh, tell us about Paul. Well, it's about... I mean, it's about <clears throat> the whole idea that... <clears throat> Comedy is supposed to be, Mark Twain's supposed to come up with the idea that comedy is tragedy plus time. And so I sort of examined the idea that the bigger a tragedy is, the more time has to elapse, as it were, before it's something funny. So I talk about, like, how I got my car broken into, but the very next night I was making jokes about it. But a death in the family is something that takes a, a bit longer before you can make jokes about it. So, yeah, my little brother, Paul, died two years ago now. And uh, he was very funny. Cause he, he worked in comedy. He, worked he, in comedy. he, he put he, other comedian he did, shows he, together. He yeah. was at Edinburgh, very well known in the business. Very much so. He was a director of comedy. I think he directed four or five of Andrew Maxwell's uh, Edinburgh Fringe shows. And he worked with people just help, helping them to become funnier. And he would... It seems like a weird thing to talk about in comedy, you know, but he would absolutely want me to take his death and turn it into a one-person <laughs> touring comedy show. So as I say to the audiences, if you don't laugh at this shit, you're the ones disrespecting the dead. Which is... <laughs> Quite a bit of emotional blackmail to play pull on your audience early doors, but yeah, he was he was he was very funny and he was very he was very philosophical about it himself. Like I remember when I visited him in the hospital, um, he, he his liver had failed and he knew he needed a transplant. And he, he was sitting there in the hospital canteen, and he even said, "He's like, um, you know what? It's not um, <clears throat> it's not the fact that I might die. I'm obviously not jazzed about that. It's more the fact that in order for me to live." someone else has to die. Like, he, would, he was talking, he was like, that that was a lot to take on, that it could be somebody nicer than him, and he's waiting for them to die so he can have their liver. And he's like, I'm sitting there like a vampire waiting for someone else's liver, and it's just a lot to deal with. And I'm like, yeah, I imagine that's, that's, that's pretty heavy. And then he just went, but you know what? Two people probably died to make me fucking iPhone. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the sort of person we're dealing with here. So I do feel like, you know, when somebody comes out with something like that about their own situation, you, you, it kind of gives me license. You got to run with that. Yeah. You got to run with that. Would it be fair to say you guys were 
you had a close relationship, uh, like any family, maybe a bit complicated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we were close, close, but close but volatile. I think would yeah, they, be would be the, the, the yeah. I, I I do tell a story in the show about the fact that we had a massive row, and we didn't speak for ages, and that we did then reconcile before he died, and that's a very important part of the show. And that's why you know the the show does end on a positive note, where I do try and urge people to to, to reach out to to anybody that they're no longer speaking to, because. You know, it, it, we, we, we are here for not long enough. And, you know, I try, I try not to, I'm not, I don't break into singing The Living Years by Mike and the Mechanics or anything like that. It's not that bad. <laughs> but I do try and that, that's the sort of positive message is that uh, reconciliation, because we did, we, we had a big falling out and then did reconcile. And that's, yeah, it's quite, that's, that's sort of, because talking about death is, is a tricky thing to try and make funny, but it's, it's funny stuff happens when people die. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's the weirdest thing. I remember, I remember when my auntie died, my auntie Frankie, we were all, at, we, we, she was cremated in Glasnevin. And I remember standing there and the hearse came in and we all start crying. And then as the hearse got closer, we looked in and we're going, who are those people in that hearse? We don't know those people. That's not our auntie. <laughs> we're all realizing we're just crying over the wrong hearse. <laughs> and I'm sure the people in the hearse were looking at us going, who are these people crying at our dad? We don't know these people. Does he have a secret family we don't know about? <laughs> You know, and then we started laughing about the fact that we're crying at the wrong hearse. You know, it's just, it's, it happens. It's, this is death, how, so, death so, just can be funny and you have to, you kind of have to embrace that. You gotta, this is the way you gotta weave it together. Yeah. Uh, the show is coming uh, here in June. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna be playing, is it? Uh, at the Liberty Hall Liberty in Hall? June and then Galway, Black Box, and then I, I bounced around and back again, I think in November. And there's a, yeah, there's a few, 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 yeah. There's a few between now and the end uh, of the year. Uh, honestly, when you're talking to other comedians and, you know, comedians generally, when somebody has a really good show, but, you know, people don't go, you should go and see this because they go, shit, I wish I had a thought of something that funny. If you see one comedy show this year, uh, it, it's this show. It is five stars and more. Uh, Ed brings tragedy plus time to Ireland with gigs in Dublin, Belfast and Galway in June. Uh, and then Limerick, Kilkenny and Cork later this year for tickets. Go fetch it, edburn.com. Give it up one more time for Ed Byrne. Yeah.